check. One of the things that I'd like you to understand is that all of the participants that are on the field today that you see walking around in the period clothes, they're all volunteers. They, um, they pay their own way. They pay an admission fee to come. And um, they buy all their uniforms and their fancy dresses and headpieces. And they buy their weapons. They buy their shoes and their socks. Most of them buy, try to buy period correct um, articles of clothing to, uh, to enhance their experience and to make it better for you that you understand a little more about the period of uh, 1850 to 1860, 70, 1870, that 20 year period. Nice. The Army was divided into three main sections. The artillery, which you're experiencing now. Artillery was usually further behind the line because they had a range of a lot farther. But many times they got involved in, in close order combat. And uh, as a result of that, the, their armament would change instead of... Uh, Each of the infantry soldiers is wearing a, a number of <clears throat> leather belts. The waist belt, usually you have a... a
The infantry soldier had uh, a number of steps before he could fire his musket. It was a single shot musket. Most of them rifled muskets that came out at the beginning of the war between the, the Revolutionary War and the war between the states. At the early part of the war, there were still a lot of smoothbore muskets that shot a round ball. And they were not as accurate. But it, the, the, uh, when the rifling muskets, when the rifling and musket balls were, were found, and, and they came out with a Frenchman named Monet, came out with a conical shaped bullet that uh, would mushroom on it when it was ignited. And uh, it would grab the rifle in and, and put the, con the, the conical shape of the projectile in a, in a path that was a lot more accurate. So during the, the war between the states or the Civil War, infantry soldiers became more accurate in their fire, which led to high casualties. But to fire that musket, it required them to reach in the side pouch, it's a, a, a pouch that's about uh, eight inches by about five inches, pull a cartridge out, tear the top of the cartridge off with their teeth, um, pour the gunpowder down the muzzle, then drop the, the projectile the, what they call the mini ball, then put the wadding in, ram it, and then take a small little brass cap with fulminated mercury in it out of their cap box, which you'll see on their belts kind of towards the front. Put it on the cone or nipple of the of the musket because this was a, a percussion instrument, not not a flintlock. A, a lot, a lot more. Uh, reliable than a flintlock. They would pull the thing, the, the hammer back, and then wait for a firing command. And when they were given the command to fire, they would pull the trigger, the, the, the hammer would slam down on the cone, hitting the cap, and that would ignite the gunpowder in the breech, and then the projectile went flying. There goes the sugar. The Confederates are able to push the Federals back right now. There's another mushroom cloud. 
Seems like they're firing in random order. They're not. There are a specific firing commands for each uh, company and uh, battalion, and regiment. Oftentimes, they'll they'll fire by a company or file fire by a, a file or fire by rank. A rank would be the front rank and the rear rank. Files are guys that are lined up behind each other. So firing by fire from the right would mean that the first two guys on the right of the company would come up and fire and then recover arms. The second file would come up and fire, recover arms. The third would come, would come up and fire and they'd go all the way down the line of the company. Now a company usually consisted of 100 guys. These are small companies. Um, mainly because it's hard to put a hundred guys on the field under the same command these days. These, all these units are, are formed up by friends and acquaintances and people that live in different areas where they have uh, ancestors that nice. fell in with a certain <laughs> company, so they may be representing their ancestors. Mm -hmm. So if you see them firing down the line, that's fire by files. And oftentimes the company commander, if they're in a regimental formation, they can afford to fire by companies. But when the whole company fires, then they're kind of left uh, in a, a bad position, uh, somewhat vulnerable because everybody in their company has already fired their muskets and it takes them about 30 seconds to reload. In the meantime, the enemy can be firing down again. But the company commander or the battalion commander or the regimental uh, commander would give them the order fire by company, fire by battalion, or fire at will, independent fire. Now this company right in front of us here, they're firing by file. So as they fire, as soon as the individual fires, he loads immediately and continues firing until the company commander, the first sergeant, calls a ceasefire or come to the ready, load to the ready, all of those commands tell the guys uh, to either stop what they're doing and load, if they're already loaded, come to the ready, which is a position basically before for uh, aim and fire. One of the things that people don't understand is how much time the soldiers during the, the battles, uh, the main battles, how long they were in camp and how much they drilled. 
they drilled a lot. They practiced what they were doing on the field. Because when you put a regiment that's basically 10 companies with a thousand infantrymen and moving them in, in sequence to certain parts of the battlefield, it takes a lot of coordination and they have to know what they're doing. Otherwise it creates a lot of chaos. A battalion was usually three to four companies which would be approximately three or four hundred men. These companies you're seeing now are anywhere from 10 to 20, maybe 30 rifles. Confederate side is rather a, a, a big variety of different colors and and uh, styles. You'll see some of them that are in the kersey blue or the lighter blue. Those were the mainstay of the the Federal forces. So uh, in the late war, the Confederates weren't issuing kersey blue that I'm aware of. But if they're wearing them, they probably stole them off a dead Yankee. Uh, they would take their shoes and take their coats, but you'll see some brown or light brown and light gray um, shell jackets, which is a jacket that comes to about the belt line. Those are called shell jackets. The, the brown ones and the real light gray are made out of a cotton and wool blend called jean wool, and it was a way to save on supplies since the South was um, at a disadvantage to having manufacturing. See, the South raised all the cotton. The Yankees took it and, and uh, used it up north. So the South didn't have a lot of manufacturing. It was basically uh, an agricultural society. All the all of the the main the big factories, the foundries, the ammunition the depots were in the. Dark, dark navy blue, those are wool uniforms. And one of the advantages to a wool uniform is that if you got an ember, a fire ember on them, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't burn as quick as, um, as cotton. We're starting to see some casualties on the field. And you'll notice there are nurses running around uh, with some of the units. Once, once they uh, litter the field with, with uh, wounded when, when the battle's over when the battle was over the the ambulance corps would come in and move the wounded to a hospital which was usually a, a fair distance from the field maybe in a church a school or a, a large home or a town hall and today you 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 want to take, take advantage of the um medical scenario is right down here to your, I guess that's west, to the west. Inside the fence you'll see a hospital. And there'll be a surgeon down there, his name is Dan. Dr. Dan. Not Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> Dr. Dan and Miss Shelley and their assistants. And they'll be, he's going to be taking, he's going to be lopping off some limbs, some hands and arms and legs doing some uh, bullet extractions. You don't want to miss that. It's a great a great uh, educational show. And uh, your kids will definitely love it. And so you need to, as soon as, soon as the final salute is made, then you need to go down to the west, which would be if you're facing the battlefield to your right, 
and uh, catch, go across the bridge and catch the medical scenario that uh, at the Union Hospital. And we know many, many of reenactors' lives have been saved by Dr. Dan, although some of them came out without limbs. But the fortunate ones that lived may have had to hobble away from the hospital. But they were in good hands. It's hard to understand. The Confederates are being pushed by that small federal contingent. So they're pressing, the Federals are pressing. Now that federal force has gotten loaded, and this is the time to pour on them because they can't shoot back. Fast shooters down there in the Henry rifles. That's the, that's the, the fun thing about being federal is you can have a Henry. Not that there were any Henrys in the state of Florida, but. The federal cavalry down here. Oh, 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 oh,
Well done. I'm not blocking the kick there, Mark. Ceasefire. 